Lipke and this is Dan Beachy Quick. So my first question about your book, Circles Apprentice, is about circles and spirals and sort of the meaning of that because it seems that it's reflected not only in the content but also in the form that the poems begin small but then spiral out into a larger idea and then come back to a, another kind of smallness. Yeah, well, I, I might address the question by, by kind of backing up um, to when I first began thinking about circles and spirals in ways that felt poetically meaningful to me. And it goes back to a, a book I wrote called Mulberry, where the kind of key metaphors are, involves a silkworm and its cocoon. And, and what makes a silkworm's cocoon so valuable is it's one long, continuous strand, you know, um, uh, extraordinarily long and extraordinarily delicate. And I, I began kind of meditating on that and thought, you know, if one uh, stretched it out and marked it as a, as a child might, uh, with all of history's events and one's own life and, and created a timeline and then did this absurd poetic activity of trying to spiral it back into a cocoon, that those areas that might have centuries between them could find themselves in a sudden proximity. And it began to feel to me that one of the kind of potencies of lyric imagination is that it brings in to extraordinarily close proximity within the space of the poem that which in history bears no connection, say, of the years that link them. Um, and that felt really powerful to me. And, and by the time I began working on putting the poems uh, in Circle's Apprentice into a collection, I really wanted to think about circles, not just from that image and related to history and time, but I was thinking of mythic circles, heroic patterns of the daily rituals of waking up and uh, you know getting kids out the door and, and how that's happening all at the same time, that one is involved in a kind of circular pattern in which one barely feels the motion mind through yourself that, that it is. This, this going towards uh, death, of course, but the way in which the mythic mind also sees every year as a return to an initial point. Um, and I began to take Emerson's sense in circles very seriously, that we spend our entire lives apprentice um, to the fact that around every circle another circle can be drawn, and, and began in some ways to feel that one of the primary works a given poem does is that it discovers its own limit, and the next poem occurs because that limit has to be broken. I wanted to ask you about one of the tactics you use where you draw attention to the surface of the poem as a line. For instance, in Minotaur's page, the first line is, this line is a thread attached to this point. Um, and in some sense, I get the sense that this is a, both about the myth and it's also about maybe what a line of poetry is. Yeah, well, I f often fear I make things up, but <laughs> I'm uh, under uh, the impression that uh, the word lines, uh, the word line etymologically traces back to linen and the linen thread in particular. Mm -hmm. And that thought uh, made me think very much about Theseus and the labyrinth and the way he escaped it only through um, the thread that was uh, given to him. And I began to, to think through that, that poem in a certain sense that uh, the poet might find the blank page for him or herself uh, as if one could sense within its blankness a kind of maze, a kind of labyrinth that to the eye appears just absolutely blank. And one of the paradoxes of poetic activity is that the only way you begin to find the labyrinth you're in is by writing the poem that makes its particular turns and angles and bewilderments visible. And so the line at that level, winding from side to side, margin to margin, became for me a, a kind of uh, linen thread in Theseus's hands in a way. Um, and that feels also very uh, human in a certain sense, that the poem gives us this example where it only discovers the riddle it is by having been written most fully out. It's not there to solve the problem. Um, and I don't think that consciousness is here to solve any problems for us either, that at our moments of highest consciousness, I imagine we feel most truly bewildered. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, I mean, uh, I wanted to ask finally, um, in terms of illusions, you use illusions in a, in a particularly interesting kind of way. Sometimes the distance between the surface of your poem and uh, the myth, for instance, uh, the myth about Midas's um, barber, uh, where these reeds turn into to a voice. Uh, sometimes that's at a great distance, um, and sometimes it's more uh, pronounced. But And I wanted to sort of ask you about how these sort of influence you or maybe inspire you or in, make you think differently as a poet? Yeah, well, that whole book and, and in many ways almost everything I've done has been riddled in, in certain ways with the presence of other texts and sometimes it feels almost like some strange ontological drift of the fact of uh, a given myth that has so sort of saturated my thinking for a time that it naturally finds its way into poem and, and in some sense tries to take root there and in, in the way that tradition tries to take root um, in the present moment. At other times, certain lines, you know, like Hopkins and Peace, when, when, will you peace, become a kind of mantra, a kind of uh, splinter in the brain that the rest of the poem is trying to find a way either to push into the brain deeper or extract completely. Um, but in the end, I guess, I guess I've simply come to feel that the writing of a poem is a strange offering back to that which has already been written, a kind of gift that you hope is worthy enough to be part of a conversation you can't have in any other way about writing the poem. Um, and I think you write them back to the dead, more than, in a certain sense, you write them to the people who um, have them in their hands now. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed reading your book, uh, Circles Apprentice. Uh, this is Dan Beachy Quick. This is uh, American Literary Reviews, A Literary Thought Bubble. Thanks for watching.